Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Victoria Martins? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Victoria Martins was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico on August 26, 2006. Her mother was named Michelle Martins. Victoria had one younger half-brother. The family lived in an apartment in Albuquerque. Victoria's mother, Michelle, had various romantic relationships while living in the apartment. On March 28, 2016, an anonymous complaint was made about Michelle and her current boyfriend, David. He allegedly attempted to kiss Victoria. Michelle kicked David out of the house. Using the website Plenty of Fish, Michelle met a career criminal named Fabian Gonzalez in late July 2016. It's not clear what characteristics Michelle was looking for in a romantic partner, but if she wanted a man with a long criminal history, she was successful. Among his crimes, Fabian was convicted in February of 2015 for battery against a household member. He had received two years of supervised probation for this crime. Not long after meeting Michelle, Fabian moved into her apartment. He used drugs like methamphetamine and would have friends over to the apartment when no one else was there. Eventually, Michelle started using drugs with Fabian. In August of 2016, Fabian invited his cousin, Jessica Kelly, to move into Michelle's apartment. Like Fabian, Jessica had a long criminal history. She had been in and out of prison several times over the course of the last 10 years. She had two felony drug convictions, and she had been convicted for conspiracy to commit an assault of a sexual nature. This offense occurred when she was in prison. The victim was another inmate. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On August 23, 2016, which was Victoria's 10th birthday, she stepped off the school bus at about 4 p.m. No one was there to pick her up. A neighbor eventually brought her home. Victoria arrived at 4.25 p.m. Jessica was in the apartment at this time, but Michelle and Fabian were not. They returned at 5.07 p.m. Not long after this, Michelle and Fabian left to go to a gas station. They returned at about 6.15 p.m. They left again 15 minutes later and returned at 7.02 p.m. At 7.05 p.m., Victoria was seen alive by neighbors, which would be the last time she was observed in this condition. Michelle and Fabian left one minute later. They would not return until 8.47 p.m. Sometime between 7.45 p.m. and 8.30 p.m., when Michelle and Fabian were not at the apartment, Victoria was murdered by strangulation. At about 4.30 a.m., now on August 24, Michelle and Fabian exited the apartment and made contact with neighbors. They said that Jessica had attacked them with an iron, and Victoria was in the apartment with Jessica. A neighbor called 911 and reported the disturbance. After the police arrived, they found Fabian and Michelle outside of the apartment. Jessica was inside the apartment. The police attempted to enter the apartment, but Jessica locked the door. She then jumped off of the balcony in an effort to escape. It would appear as though physics was not Jessica's strong suit. She did not account for the effect of gravity and broke her ankle. The police took her into custody. As this was going on, the police noticed that there was smoke coming out of the apartment. When they entered, they found a gruesome scene. Victoria's dismembered body was in the bathtub. She was wrapped in a blanket, which was still smoldering. Someone had set Victoria's body on fire, and Jessica was the only person in the apartment at that time. The police questioned Jessica. Here's what she told them. She was babysitting Victoria while Fabian and Michelle were out of the apartment. A well-dressed man with a Mexican accent entered the apartment and asked for Fabian using Fabian's street name. Jessica had never seen the mystery man before, but he seemed to know his way around the apartment. The man entered Victoria's bedroom and strangled her. As he was leaving, he told Jessica that she would have to dispose of the body. 
Jessica claimed that the motive for the actions of the well-dressed man was to get revenge on Fabian for something related to drugs and money. At 8.47 p.m., when Michelle and Fabian had returned from their last trip, Jessica brought Victoria's body out to their vehicle. Michelle didn't realize what was going on. They all went back inside the apartment, at which time Fabian and Jessica dismembered Victoria's body in the bathroom. Fabian told Michelle to make dinner in order to distract her from what he and Jessica were doing in the bathroom. Michelle fell asleep not long after this. When Fabian finished with the dismemberment task, he climbed in bed next to Michelle and went to sleep. During this entire time, Michelle, Fabian, and Jessica were high on drugs. Jessica was having a particularly rough time with paranoia caused by the drugs. She believed that she needed to kill Michelle and Fabian because they might turn her into the police thinking that she killed Victoria, like they wouldn't believe her story about the mystery man. She retrieved an iron and attacked Michelle and Fabian. The couple was able to get the iron away from Jessica. Michelle was concerned with Victoria's safety. Again, she didn't know about the murder. She ran to a neighbor's residence so the police would be notified. The police did not believe Jessica. They were positive that not only was she involved in the murder, but that Michelle and Fabian were involved as well. The police interviewed Michelle for several hours. Michelle's initial story was that she and Fabian were asleep in the bedroom when Jessica attacked them with an iron out of nowhere. The couple ran out of the apartment and contacted neighbors to call the police. This story matched what Jessica told the police. After hearing Michelle's story, the police lied to her by saying that Fabian confessed and implicated her. Eventually, Michelle came up with a new version of her story. She told the police that she had a history of inviting men over to the apartment so that they could commit offenses against Victoria while she watched. This activity gave her gratification. She said that Fabian and Jessica had offended against Victoria a few times in the days leading up to Victoria's death. On August 23, Michelle gave Victoria methamphetamine to calm her down. After she did this, Fabian and Jessica assaulted and murdered Victoria before dismembering and burning her body. The police were satisfied with this confession. Michelle, Fabian, and Jessica were all charged with a number of offenses, including murder. Here's what investigators discovered over the course of the next several months. There was no methamphetamine in Victoria's system. Again, Michelle had claimed that Victoria consumed methamphetamine. DNA from an unknown man was found on Victoria's back, which appears to support Jessica's story about a mysterious intruder. Cell phone records indicated that Michelle and Fabian were not at the apartment when the murder occurred. This information changed the way investigators thought about the case. They now believed that there was actually a mystery man and that Michelle and Fabian were not involved in the murder. On June 29, 2018, Michelle pleaded guilty to one count of reckless child abuse resulting in death. This is a felony. She is facing between 12 and 15 years in prison. In theory, she created an environment which led to Victoria's death. That's how the charge was supported. Jessica Kelly pleaded no contest to charges related to Victoria's death, including the same charge that Michelle pleaded guilty to, as well as aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and tampering with evidence. The aggravated assault was for attacking Fabian and Michelle with an iron. Jessica was sentenced to 50 years in prison with six years suspended. Although technically this comes to 44 years, Jessica could earn enough good time credit to be released in 22 years. On August 1, 2022, Fabian Gonzalez was found guilty of reckless abuse of a child resulting in death, seven counts of felony tampering with evidence, and one count of felony conspiracy to tamper with evidence. He is facing a minimum sentence of 18 years and could be sentenced to as many as 40 years in prison. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, a mental health professional testified that Michelle was susceptible to making false confessions. She was referred to as a people pleaser. She had histrionic personality features and was extremely shallow. When she made the false confession, she actually thought she was helping her case, like she believed she was giving the police information which would make her look not guilty. This was really more like a false admission 
from Michelle's point of view. When Michelle was pregnant with Victoria, she denied that she was pregnant right up until she gave birth. Michelle had a history of not accepting reality. The police lied and used other tactics of manipulation in order to get a confession that matched what they already believed. It didn't bother them that Michelle could have faced life in prison for her false confession. To them, Michelle was a dangerous drug user, not someone who had rights that should be protected or whose life had value. When they told Michelle that her daughter was dead, the police said that she had no emotions. To them, that was proof of her guilt. I think what happened here is that when the police came upon the grisly crime scene, they allowed their emotions and their bias to get the best of them. They saw three people high on drugs and figured that those three people must have been the killers. It didn't strike them as unusual that Michelle and Fabian ask neighbors to call the police. Why would they have done that if they had just murdered somebody? Item number two, while Fabian and Jessica both had extensive criminal histories, Michelle Martins did not have a criminal record. Clearly, Michelle was irresponsible, and she should not have been using drugs. But her plea deal involved accepting responsibility for creating an environment that led to death. The police believed that the mystery man really did commit the murder, yet they also wanted Michelle to pay for the death of her daughter. I realize that Michelle will probably never be nominated for the Mother of the Year Award, and that she probably did commit some type of offense in this case. But there aren't too many cases where a mystery man enters an apartment and kills a child, and the mother of the victim, who was not even there when the murder occurred, is convicted in connection with her child's death. There is a sense that Michelle is paying for a crime that she didn't technically commit. With that in mind, I actually do believe that Michelle was guilty as charged. But I don't think under normal circumstances she would have been charged. I think her status as a drug user led to those charges. Which takes me to item number three. Fabian does not come out looking too good in this case either, but it's not clear how his behavior was tied to Victoria's death. Investigators said that he left Victoria with Jessica, knowing that Jessica was dangerous. Now, morally, it was his responsibility to protect Jessica, but legally, it's more challenging to make that argument. Again, I think a better argument about creating a dangerous environment can be made against Michelle as Victoria's mother. As far as Fabian helping with the dismemberment and all that, there's not much evidence to support that theory. Now, his DNA was found on trash bags and knives, which were used as part of the crime scene cleaning, but he lived in the apartment, so of course his DNA would be on various objects in the apartment. No other evidence other than Jessica's statement ties him to the cleanup effort. His DNA was not on Victoria, and her DNA was not on him. Moving to item number four, I'm not sure about this whole mystery man theory. The DNA from the unknown male was a partial sample. It's not really clear if the DNA is significant at all. Even if the DNA is from an unknown male, that doesn't prove he took part in a crime. What if Jessica called a male friend of hers over to the apartment to help her clean up? The man walked into the bathroom and touched Victoria, realized that she was dead, and said, I don't want any part of this. I think it's reasonable to believe that Jessica fabricated a story about the mystery man and that she may have been responsible for Victoria's death. It seems clear that she cleaned up the crime scene and burned the body. Usually only a guilty person would go to those lengths to destroy evidence. I find it very difficult to believe that Jessica did this due to fear of a mystery man who mentioned how she better clean up the scene as he walked out of the door. Why wouldn't she simply call the police? In addition, she attacked Michelle and Fabian and had a history of violence against women. Now, it may be that Jessica felt as though Michelle and Fabian had a few wrinkles that needed to be removed, or it may be that she was continuing a night of physical attacks on people. This whole case can be pieced together without any fantasy man wearing nice clothing. Item number five. Some people look at this case and think, okay, the police made a few mistakes and maybe charges were flying around that were not technically correct. But all three of the suspects were terrible people. They were using drugs around a vulnerable individual and not taking good care of her. Therefore, they need to be in prison regardless of what they technically did or did not do. My concern with this thinking is that it's not consistent with the purpose of having laws and rights. I think one good way to measure the criminal justice system 
is how it treats people who are not desirable to society. Even people who misbehave deserve to have their rights protected under the law. Now moving to my final thoughts. When people think of individuals using dangerous drugs like methamphetamine, sometimes they argue on their behalf and say that drug users are only hurting themselves, so it's no big deal. Victoria was 10 years old and a victim of drugs. She didn't have any methamphetamine in her system, but the drugs contributed to her death anyway. It's not just people who deal drugs that are dangerous. People who use them can be dangerous sometimes as well. Not all the time, but sometimes. When someone is intensely focused on using drugs to such a degree that the life of a child has no value, prison is the right place for them. Those are my thoughts on the case of Victoria Martins. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.